This is new material that's just been coming out. Some of it has only come out in the last year. Almost every year we're now updating this new material. This is absolutely, it's, been the, it's, been, it's made my job an awful lot easier. In 33 years of working with Muslims, we never had what we're going to show you this afternoon. Some of it we introduced last year. For those of you, how many were here last year when we introduced some of this material on the Quran? We're going to go one step further and we're going to show you not only how what we're finding out about Muhammad, but how, what we're finding about how Islam actually began and what uh, Muslims have to contend with. This is material that we're using. I'm not asking any of you to use this material, okay? It's very polemical. It's very controversial. It's very confrontational. But you'll see why. So let's move right into it and let's ask the question that Muslims are all claiming. Remember yesterday we talked about ISIS and we noticed that every Muslim, whether they are radical, whether they are nominal, whether they are liberal, are dependent on two things. Every Muslim is dependent on the man and the book, the book and the man, the book and the man, the book and the man, the Quran and Muhammad. Of course, beyond that, then comes everything else, fault. If you can destroy the book, if you can destroy the man, you've destroyed Islam. As simple as that. And I would suggest we, are, we start from the same paradigm as Christians, do we not? We're also dependent on a bigger book, a better man. And that's why it's very important that these questions have been thrown against us. Much of what I'm going to introduce today, we're talking about historical criticism, redacted criticism, source criticism, literary criticism. All of these have been applied against our Bible and against Jesus Christ. And it decimated the church back in 1905. We have now done our homework, thanks to the British, who have stolen an awful lot of the material to put it into one book, uh, one place called the British Museum. We can pretty well now support much of the biblical narrative. And that's the great thing about it. We have passed this test with the Bible and with Jesus Christ. Islam is just beginning to have that done to it. And this is what we're going to introduce today. So if the book and the man is the most important thing, Muhammad and the Quran, what do we know about Muhammad? This is the classical account that you've all been told. As long as you've been uh, going to school, this is what you're told all the time. That he was born in 570, received his revelation in 610. Uh, for the next 12 years, he received the Meccan surahs. Then he moved to, Mecca, uh, to Medina in 622, called the Hijrah. He then received another eight years of, actually 10 years of revelation from 622 to 632. Died suddenly in 632. When he dies, Abu Bakr takes over, then comes Umar after him, then comes Uthman, and then comes Ali. And that's the Rashidun era. That is the 40-year period from 624 to 661 that all Muslims want to get back to. That's what ISIS wants to get back to. That's the period uh, known as the golden period of Islam. And that's, uh, that's the environment uh, that they would like to take us back. Now, that story, and all, I'm just giving you the bare skeleton. Everything that you know from 570 up until 661, you would assume comes from people that were actually living at that time, right? You would hope it was coming from people that actually lived, certainly in that century. You would have hoped so. But here's the problem. Everything that we know about this period of time does not get written down till this period of time. Let me just put it onto one graph so you know what I'm talking about. So everything we know about how Islam began, who Muhammad was, where he was born, all the revelations and all how the Quran was put together, does not get written at all during the 7th century. It doesn't get written down during the 8th century. It starts to get written down with a man named Ibn Ishaq in 765. We don't have any of his material. We're dependent on this man, Ibn Hisham. So it's not till 833 that we get the first reference, the first biography of this man named Muhammad or how Islam began. That's 200 years after the fact. Does that, does that bother any of you? The first time we get any of his sayings, the hadith, are not written down till this part here, Al-Buhari, 870. That's 240 years after the fact. Does that bother you? It should bother all of you. Because none of these people were living at this time. They never were in that same century. They, never, they weren't even in Arabia. They're, they were living in what is today Iran and Iraq, hundreds of miles away and hundreds of years distant. And then the tafsir and the tahrik, which come after that, which would be the commentaries, they don't get written down until al dabari puts them down. And that's the, that's the 10th century. So what we know that's happening in the 7th century doesn't get written down till the 9th and the 10th century, two to 300 years later. Now, we know that Jesus, we know pretty much quite a bit about him. We know what he did. We know what he said because they were written down almost immediately. Within 40 to 60 years of his death, we already have the four Gospels. 
That's the Sira of Jesus. That would be the biography of Jesus, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's also the Hadith of Jesus, the sayings of Jesus, which would be the red letter part of the Gospels, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We would have the commentaries, which would be the letters of Paul, written within 15 to 30 years of Christ, uh, within, and 20 years of Christ's death. And then you have the, the Tahrik, which would be the histories of the early church, the book of Acts, written between 52 and 62 AD, within 20 to 30 years of Christ's death. So everything we know about Jesus historically, we can pretty well know that the people that wrote it either were living at that time, knew him personally, like John and Matthew knew him personally, or got it from those who did know him, got it from the eyewitnesses. Can you see the difference? When you do a comparison, all that we know about the emergence of Christianity, who Jesus was, what he did and said, comes within 50 to 60 years after Christ's death. For that of Islam, all we know about who Muhammad was, how it began, what the Quran was, and all that, comes from two to three hundred years. Now, why haven't we been told that? And you need to ask this question, because everything you're going to hear about Muhammad, just ask one simple question. Where did you get that story from? Did it come from the time, even the century, where he lived? All right, let's move on. The scholar's concern is this. Why did it take so long to write it down? Were these people not literate? Listen, by 652, after 10 years of Muhammad's death, after 642, sorry, within 10 years of Muhammad's death, Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo were under Arab control. You notice I'm not saying Muslim, I'm saying Arab. So the five great cities of the Levant all came under the Arab control. These were literate cities. By the time Abdul Malik comes to power in 685, they've moved right across North Africa, all the way to Spain in the west, to India in the east. That whole swath of land was under their control and has remained under their control except for Spain and Israel. It's still under their control today. Are you telling me that nobody could read or write in that whole swath of land from Spain to India? Please. Of course they could read or write. So why was this not written down? Why did nobody preserve it? If this was the greatest prophet in the history of mankind, if this is the seal of all prophets, why did they not write down his story? Why they did not write down what he said and what he did? See, that's the questions historians are refusing to ask, so we're asking it. What's more, what we do know about Muhammad, what we do know about what Islam was and where this man lived and what he did, if it all comes to us from the 9th and 10th century, should we trust it or should we not go back to the 7th century? Why don't we go back to that time period and ask the questions that they are? And the best men in the world and the best women in the world are doing just that. These are the scholars I'm going to be using today. Dr. John Wansborough, head of School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. He was the one that blew open this whole thing in 1977 and 1978 with two books called Quranic Studies and Sectarian Milieu suggested that we've got a real problem with trusting most everything we know about who Muhammad was, what the Quran was, what uh, the city called Mecca, and of course, how it began. Dr. Gerald Hunting is a man that I studied at SOAS there in 1994 when I heard it for the first time. I'd already had a master's degree in Islamic studies and I knew nothing about this material. It wasn't being taught in America. It was only being taught in the University of London and in Cambridge and in Oxford. Dr. Patricia Corona, who was my supervisor when I started my doctorate, she reads and writes 15 languages, all archaic languages. These are lost languages. That's why she's so dangerous, because she goes back to the original documents, reads them in their original form, and she never translates any of them because she doesn't want Muslims to read what she found. Nonetheless, she was head of department at <laughs> Oxford University when she came out with uh, Meccan trade in the rise of Islam in 1987, got a death threat for writing that book, had to move to Cambridge University, that's where I got to know her, and then she finally finished up at Princeton University, uh, where she just died just before Christmas, so we no longer have her around. But she has probably done some of the most damaging work on Mecca. We're going to introduce her material. She's from Denmark. Dr. Andrew Rippon out of Calgary did probably the best work of taking this difficult material and bringing it down to layman's terminology. Dr. Robert Hoyland out of Oxford University, he's done the best material of looking and seeing exactly what was being write, written about these Arabs during the seventh century. And so he's the one that has written a, a concerning exactly what other people were saying about these people that, were, that existed at that time. Dr. Yehuda Neva out of University of Jerusalem has done the best material on looking at the earliest inscriptions. We're going to introduce some of his material later, and then the German school, Dr. Begerd, Dr. Luning, Dr. Gerd Puin, Dr. von Bothmer, Dr. Oling, have done the best work in the world on the earliest manuscripts. We're going to look at some of their findings of what they found, what they're now coming up with the manuscripts, the, Muslim, the Quranic manuscripts. Then there's two books that have just come out in Britain, one by Dr. Ma, uh, Tom Holland, who's not really, he's not an Islamicist, he's nothing more than a good storyteller. But he's a historian. He has three 
already bestsellers, and that's why he decided to take and go beyond Persian fire and Rubicon. He decided to go to the next step. Well, what came after the Byzantine Empire? What came after the Sassanid Empire? It was the Muslim Empire. And he started in 2006, and for six years, he usually writes a book in three years. This took him six years because he couldn't find any sources. We had to give him all his sources. And that's why he came up with this book in 2012, In the Shadow of the Sword. If you want to read one book that actually decimates and explains all this material, read that book. Read the first hundred pages and then jump to the last and read the last hundred pages and you get to know anything you need to know. Now, he did a documentary called Islam, the Untold Story. He put it on Channel 4 in August of 2012, which summarized his primary themes, but he didn't come to any conclusions. He purposely did not want to because he knew it would infuriate the Muslims. That documentary has only been shown once. Channel 4 would not show it a second time because of all the furore coming from the Muslim world. And that's why, if you want it, I have it right here on my computer. You can have it, take it home with you, and see it, watch it. It's only an hour and a half long. It summarizes much of what we're going to go through today. And then Dr. Dan Gibson has probably done the best work on looking at the geography. So let's look in some of their material. This is what they found. This is what all these scholars put together. You've seen all their names. This is the conclusions they're coming to. First of all, the first Arab inscription of the name Muhammad is not till 691. Muhammad died in 632. Do you see a problem there? Why did these people, if this is their prophet, if this is their greatest prophet, why didn't they mention him in any Arab inscription? We don't see any reference to his name. Outside of Arab uh, texts, we do have reference to his name, not, but not within Arab inscriptions. The first reference to people called Muslims is not till the 690. Well, hold on a minute. So who were these people that were, dis that were taking over? Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo, who were moving right across North Africa and moved from Spain in the West. Who were they? Well, they did call themselves things. They were actually conquering. They call themselves the Sarasins. They are known as the Hagarins in the line of Hagar. They're known as the Ishmaelites in the line of Ishmael. They're known as the Maghreb because they come from the Maghreb. They're known as the Mahajurun, the people who are in Hijr, who people who are in Exodus, like nomadic people. These are the names they call themselves, but they never call themselves Muslims. Yet these were the first Muslims, we thought. We've been told that's the narrative we've always been given. So why didn't they call themselves that in their own inscriptions? The first reference to Islam is not to the Dome of the Rock, introduced by Abdul Malik in 691, at 60 years after Muhammad died. And the first reference to a city called Mecca is not till 741. Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Think that through. Okay. You thought it through, we'll go on. The first biography of Muhammad within Islamic source is not till 833. Now, let's put this all together. These are their conclusions. How did they come to their conclusions? Let's go through it and let's remember. Now, remember, at the time that we're looking at to begin with, in 661, this is when the wide period starts. That's how much of the world Islam controlled. So they controlled the five great cities of the Levant. These were cities that were, that were sophisticated. They had libraries. They could, they could read and write. Uh, there, there's no reason in the world not to have things written down, even as late as 661. Dr. Gan Gibson, when he looked around, he noticed that when you look at the Quran, and take a look at the Quran and look at all the geographical locations in the Quran, there are 65 geographical locations listed in the Quran. Over and over again, you find that this prophet, interestingly, it only mentions that he's a prophet in Arabic. It doesn't give him a name. You will find Muhammad's name in Arabic only four times in the Quran. But he's known as the prophet who lives in a city, a settlement, but it doesn't give the name of the city. It doesn't give the name of the settlement except for once, and that's in Surah 48, Ayah 20, 28. So who, who is this man, and where does he live? Well, we do know that he has daily contact with people from Ud. 23 times, he keeps on coming in contact with people from Ud. 24 times, he has contact with people from Thamud. Seven times, these people from Midian. Which means he has daily contact with these people from these three different tribes. So where are these tribes? Take a look where they are on the map. They're way up here. Mecca's way down here. There's 600 miles between them. How did he have contact with people that are 600 miles away? Curious, isn't it? That's the first problem. Secondly, if he wasn't, if he's so far away, then what are we going to do with Mecca? This is the million dollar question. We do read about it in Surah 48, Ayah 24. I mentioned, I said to, uh, verse 28, it should be verse 24. Surah 48, Ayah 24. This is the only reference to Mecca in the entire Quran. Yet it's such an important city. Why? Because when Adam and Eve were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, according to that, they're up in space, that's in Surah 7, they were thrown down, according to their traditions, to this place called Mecca. So it would be the first settlement in the history of mankind. There is no one earlier than Adam and Eve, right? 
it's where Adam, it's where Abraham went, was living in Surah 21. If you look at Surah 21, he is in Mecca. I had no idea Abraham came from Mecca. But according to the Quran, that's where he lived. He goes into the Kaaba and destroys all the idols in the Kaaba. They throw him into a fiery pit. And then he's saved by an angel of the Lord. That sounds like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But what's it doing and what's that say about Mecca? That means at least Mecca was in existence in 1900 BC when Abraham was living, right? And Mecca is the center of trade, north, south, east, and west, according to all the traditions. This is called the trade route theory. Trade route theory made uh, 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 by, popular by Montgomery Watt. Now, we do know quite a bit about this place where this prophet lived, though it doesn't give it a name. We do know that it's in a valley, that it has a stream going through it, it has a parallel valley, it has a pillar of salt right outside, which this prophet goes by in the morning and comes back in the evening, possibly, uh, obviously referring to the wife of Lot, who turns to a pillar of salt. It has fields, trees, gray, uh, grass, clay, loam. It has olive trees. That's right there. It should have red flags. And that there's a mountains overlooking the Kaaba. The problem is Mecca is not in a valley. It does not have stream going through it. It doesn't have any water. It only has one well, the Zumzum well. cannot even accommodate the caravans that went there. It does not have a pillar of salt. There are no fields, trees, grass, clay, loam, or olive trees. There are no olive trees except for the Mediterranean world, 600 miles further north. There have never been olive trees in Arabia. So you can see there's a problem here. Because wherever this place is, it cannot be Mecca. So, what do we know about Mecca? I've just told you all that, so we'll go beyond that. You can come back to that. Those are all the things I just mentioned. Take a look at a map from the 7th century. This is a Byzantine map of the trade routes. Where is Mecca on that map? You notice? If it's the center of trade, if it's one of the greatest cities in the history of mankind, if it's the oldest city in the history of mankind, why is it not on any map? That's just a Byzantine map from the 7th century. Take a look at this map. This is the trade route. Again, this, look or see where Mecca should be. Mecca should be right there. It's not on this map either from the 7th century. But look at what is at the center of trade. We'll come back to that. Dr. Patricia Corona noticed this, and of course she was curious because she looked at this map, which is from the 7th century, and she noticed that all the trade would have come from India over here and China over here, and would have come right up through the Persian Gulf to get over to the Mediterranean world. The problem was the Sassanids here were warring with the Byzantines here. For 200 years, they warred back and forth between the 5th, 6th, up to the 7th century, which shut down the trade going through here. It had to be redirected across the Arabian Sea down to Aden right there. And then from Aden, it went right across, up across the western plateau, the western plateau of Arabia, uh, from Aden going up to Najran, Sana, up to Taif, down to Mecca, according to the traditions, back up to Yath Thrib to Tabuk, uh, Kaibar, and then on up to Gaza. Now, my 10-year-old son saw a problem with that. Let's see if any of you can see a problem. Those of you who were here last year, don't mention it. What, do you see, what problem do you see with that theory right there? Why wouldn't they unload it where? In Aden? Yeah, yeah, down there. Okay, Aden. Why don't they just go up what? Gotcha. Good man. He's as good as my 10-year-old son. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a no-brainer. If you're already on board ship and you've come off the west coast of India, why in the world would you take it across the Arabian Sea, unload it at Aden, go 1,250 miles overland, when you know that a ton of goods for going only 50 miles by land is the same price as going 1,250 miles by sea? That's why we do everything by sea today. Even today in the 21st century, we send everything by ship. So why didn't they keep it and go right up the Red Sea? So Dr. Patricia Corona, reading and writing 15 languages, goes back and decided to investigate from the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th century, reading the original documents to see if this was true. And guess what she found? All the trade was maritime. None of it went through Arabia. There was no Arab name anywhere on any of the trading documents here on the West Coast. All the names that she could find came from here, Eritrea, Africa. They were the ones that loved to go on boats. The Arabs hated boats. That's why you don't see any ports on the western plaza, the side of Arabia. They were all camel herders. They were people that were nomadic. They were desert uh, uh, nomadic people. That's why there was no maritime trade with any Arab names. So this whole trade route theory suddenly was up in question. And then she looked at it a little more carefully. If you notice, I don't know if you can tell, but when it gets up to Taif here, it then goes down off the western plateau to get down to Mecca, a thousand uh, meters, and then it has to go back up a thousand meters to get back up to Yathrib. Mecca's not even on the trade route. The Arabian existing trade route, it's not even on that trade route, she noticed. Why had no one noticed that? For 1400 years, no one picked that up. She picked it up and wrote a book about it. 
And she just destroyed any notion of any trade route because she just quoted reference after reference. She found that the here in Stesiphon, which is now today Baghdad, that's the ar archaic name for Baghdad, they came down here to Yathrib, which is now Medina, and they found silver. They had silver mines there, and they went down to Taif, and they talk about going down to the south. No reference to any place called Mecca. Couldn't find any reference to Mecca. None. None at all until 741. 741 is the first reference she could find for Mecca. It's in, it's in the Apocalypse de Pseudometodias Continuato Byzantia Arabica. Muhammad died in 632. Can you see the problem? That's over 100 years later. Obviously, there is a problem with Mecca. We just don't have any reference to it. Look at modern-day Mecca. Look what they're doing now. The fourth largest building, tallest building in the world. That huge clock tower. That is 45 feet across that face of that clock tower. They're going to make it Mecca in Mecca time. They are now transforming Mecca. They've uh, designed it very similar to Big Ben, and they want to make, take Greenwich Mean Time and bring it over to Mecca Mean Time, MMT, instead of GMT. But take a look what they're doing. That's what they plan to do with Mecca. They're basically, they're cementing over the entire city. That's Muhammad's house. They've now cemented that over. That's Khadija, Muhammad's wife's house. They've cemented that over. Look at all the cranes. They're going to make 62 of these skyscrapers. Why do you think they're cementing everything up? They now know what we know. There is no history there. And what best to hide the history than to cement it all up so that nobody can investigate how old Mecca is. But here's the problem. If you don't have Mecca in the right place, then what are you going to do with the Qibla? See, the Qibla is the direction of prayer. Every Muslim knows exactly where to pray every day, five times a day. doesn't matter where they are in the world. They always play towards Mecca. Am I correct on that? The Qibla is sacrosanct. Every mosque you go into, you'll see a mihrab. It is designed, it is pointing towards Mecca. Is I was on the airplane there with Malaysian Airlines before it got shot down. And as we were flying across the waters, we could see on a television screen the Qibla change as we were moving. So any Muslim could get up off their seat and do the prayer at any time in the right direction. So that's why the Qibla is absolutely important because we do know that the Qibla is always, has always been directed towards Mecca since 624. According to the Quran, in Surah 2, Ayah 143, it says very clearly that the Qibla was pointed towards Mecca since 624. You want to find where the Qibla is today? You can go and get these apps on your, uh, on your phone. That's my hotel room there in Kuala Lumpur, and there you can see where the Qibla was in my hotel room. Surah 2, 134, 43, 145 gives the direction of Qibla as Mecca. Now, back in 1905, Dr. Fehervadi and Dr. Creswell were actually going through that part of the world, looking for the oldest mosques they could find and digging down to the original floor plans. They went to the Wasit Mosque and the Kufa Mosque, which is in today Iraq. And they went into the Fustat Mosque, which is just outside of Egypt, in, uh, outside of Cairo in Egypt. When they dug down to the original floor plans of both the Wasit and the Kufa Mosque, they noticed the Qibla was facing straight west. It should have been facing south. When they went to Fustat, they noticed it was facing straight east. It should have been facing southeast. There's Wasit, there's Kufa. There's Fustat. They were all facing this way. He, he, they thought in 1905 that they were facing Jerusalem. They were wrong. They were off by three to five degrees. We can't blame them. That's pretty close. Nonetheless, why were they facing that direction? Well, Dr. Dan Gibson wanted to find this out. Now, he'd been living in the, in the Arabian Peninsula. He'd been there for 20 years. His father was an archaeologist. His grandfather was an archaeologist. So he wanted to find out what can we do with this Qibla. But he was there, learned the language, and he moved all over the Middle East and decided to take pictures from space using satellite technology onto the original Qiblas because he, many of the mosques today have been destroyed and rebuilt many times. So he wanted to look to the original floor plans. By doing that, he needed to find where the original enclosures are. You can only do that from space. Look what he found. The great mosque in Guangzhou in China, built 630. Look where it's facing. It's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Humayma Mosque in, uh, in Jordan, it's facing Petra, almost completely opposite from Mecca. The Great Mosque of Baalbek in Lebanon, it's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Great Mosque of Sana, now we're in Yemen, look at the date, 705, Muhammad died in 632, the Qibla was canonized in 624, so now we're a good 70 or 75 years later, it's facing Petra, not Mecca. The al Mosque, this is interesting because there you have the al Mosque and there you have the Dome of the Rock. The entire citadel, including the Dome of the Rock, built in 691. The al Mosque, built in 709. All of them, the citadel, the Dome of the Rock, and al Mosque are all facing Petra. And they're still facing Petra today. 
They're not facing Mecca. The Damascus Mosque built in 709, it's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Anjan Mosque in Lebanon in 714, look at the date now, it's facing Petra, not Mecca. The Mosque in Umar Basra in Syria, 720, now we're almost 100 years later, it's facing Petra, not Mecca. As far away as Bandar, finally a mosque in Pakistan is finally facing Mecca in 727. That's the first mosque he could find that finally had the Qibla right. But then the very next year, he found one in Syria that was neither facing Petra or Mecca. They were a little confused there. <laughs> now, this is interesting. Here's the older mosque built in 700 in Amman in Jordan. It's facing Petra. That's built in 700. Look at this mosque here. This is built in 740. It's finally facing Mecca. What happened between 700 and 740? The new mosque is right. The old mosque is incorrect. Something happened between those years. We'll get to that. Back in 743 then, here's another mosque facing back to Petra again. So they still not, there's still not uniformity. Now, when he got to North Africa, the mosques were not facing Petra or Mecca. They were all completely confused in North Africa. Here's one in Tunisia. It's facing this direction. It's not facing Petra or Mecca. The same way here in Spain. It's facing here. It should be facing those directions. And the same way in Tunisia. Here's another one. The Kibbas this way. We're not sure yet why they're completely confused in North Africa. Take a look at where all the Kiblas were facing. Every Kibla, uniformly, were facing Petra. They weren't off by any degrees. Didn't matter how far away they were, even as far as Guangzhou in China, they were all facing Petra. And he noticed that every mosque up until 725 were facing Petra. Between 725 and 822, 12% were facing Petra, 50% were facing Mecca, 38 were, for, uh, were par point parallel, it wasn't until 822 that all the mosques begin to face Mecca. That's 200 years too late. Now, why haven't we been told this? You can see, this is the secret Muslims don't want us to know. Can you see the problems we're dealing with here? Why were they facing Petra? There's Petra right up here. Look and see what it is. It's the center of all the trade. It's the center of the Nabataean kingdom. The Nabataean, Petra is the, where the tombs and temples of the Nabataeans were. The Nabataeans are the people that give us Arabic. The Arabic script comes from the Nabataean script. The name Allah is a Nabataean god, Ilaha. Ilaha has a wife named Alat, whose formal name is Al Uza. Now, any of you who know exactly what I've just said? Alat and Al Uza and Al Manat? These are the three goddesses. Interestingly, they're not daughters at all. Alat and al Luza is the wife of Allah, which means Allah has a wife. I had no idea. I always thought Allah was one. Surah 6, Ayah 101 says Allah cannot have a consort. Well, then they shouldn't have used Allah because they've got the wrong God. This is a Nabataean God who has a Nabataean wife, which means this is a pagan God, a polytheistic God, which has nothing to do with the God we see in our Bible. Can you now see, historically, we're now destroying Allah today, but that's not for this lecture, that's for another lecture. Just to show you what we now know about what we're finding out about the Nabataean era and what we now know about Petra. Guess where the black stone comes from? The black stone that is in the Kaaba today comes from Petra. And it's referred to. Up until the 4th, 5th, and 6th century, it was always the stone that people went to worship. No wonder it's in the Kaaba in Mecca. Take a look. Petra is in a valley. Petra has a parallel valley. Petra has a stream going through it. It has fields, trees, grass, clay, loam. It has olive trees. It is near the Pillar of Salt. If there was ever any Pillar of Salt, it would be up near Petra. Petra has all the items listed above from the Quran, the Islamic traditions. Thus, could Petra be the place they are referring to? Take a look also. Where do you think Ad, Thamud, and Midian are? Ad, Thamud, and Midian, they're referred to 23, 24, and 7 times. These are the tribes all around Petra. But that's 600 miles too far north. Can you see? Something's wrong with the Quran. It's 600 miles from where it should be. So therefore, we know nothing about Muhammad until the late 7th century. We don't have his biography until the 9th century. His city doesn't even refer to until the 8th century. Thus, much of what we know Muhammad is written down hundreds of years later and hundreds of miles away. It looks like he is nothing more than a later redaction, possibly by Abdul Malik. Hold that name. You'll see why that's important. 
So the conclusion, Islam and the Prophet's life as we know it was not derived from the 7th century, but evolved over a period of two to 300 years and then redacted back to the Prophet's life and compiled in the 9th century. Now, so what happened? This is a what if. Next year, it may be a totally different what if. Because we're just getting all this material is now coming in in huge droves. So we're updating it all the time. This is what we know in 2016. May, uh, May of 2016. To make sense of all this, we need to go back to Abd al-Malik. Remember, the Arabs have now taken over Basra, Baghdad, Jerusalem, and Cairo. They have now moved right across North Africa, decimated the church there, moved all the way from Spain in the west to India in the east. That whole swath of land was under their control. But they could not run the cities because they, they were nomadic people. So who ran the cities for them? We know very well that the Arabs stayed outside the cities in garrison towns. They used, therefore, their cousins, their cousins who came from Abraham. Who were the cousins? The Jews and the Christians. They were the literate people. They were the academics. They were the ones that could run cities, and they became what they call maulis or mawalis, which would be like indentured servants. <coughs> so they run this, ran the cities. For 40 years, that worked. But by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, he is the great king. He is the son of Marwan himself, who brings in the Marwanet family of the Umayyad Caliphate. That starts in 680. He comes to power in 685. He now realizes that everything they're dependent on is from a Judeo-Christian standpoint because the Jews and the Christians have a prophetic line, don't they? That's from the line of Isaac. The Arabs don't have that prophetic line, but they're in power. They have no identity. How do you therefore get an identity? Well, you've got to have an Arab prophet. So who do you do? What do you do? Well, the first thing you do, the first thing you do is to get that identity, you start to create your identity. And we can see this on the coins. Go to the British Museum and look at the numismatic sections, and you will see that the coins there, the Byzantine coins, were taken by the Arabs, and they were just copied. So here you have the Byzantine emperor with two of his retainer. They put the caliph with two of his retainer. I didn't know that caliphs could have images. Can, is, does Islam allow images? So this obviously was before imagery was considered to be haram. Can you see the problem? This is not Islamic. This can't be Islamic if you have images of your caliph. On the back side, the Byzantine cross is repeated. They've just taken the cross piece off, but they keep the Byzantine cross there. Abdul Malik comes to power, and he has his image right there on the coin with the Byzantine cross. He then takes that off in 691. After he's been in power for six years, he then changes everything. Now, Abdul Malik, when you know, if you know anything about Abdul Malik, he is known as the great Arab reformer. He is the one that introduces Arabic as the international language. He is the one that introduces Arabic on all the coins, takes the images off, and introduces the Arabic script. And take a look and see what's on the coin. The Shahada. There has been no reference to the Shahada earlier than this. We don't know of any Bismillah on any documentation prior to 691. He introduces it on the coins. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. That's where it's first introduced on that coin right there in 691. Sorry, 692. But before that, he does something even more spectacular. He builds the Dome of the Rock. But hold on a minute. Why would he build the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem? Shouldn't he be build it down in Mecca? But he's not in Mecca. There is no Mecca. We have no reference to Mecca. Well, what about Medina? Well, he's not down there either. So where is Abdul Malik? He's way up in Damascus. Why so far north? if he's from Arabia. See, why are people not asking these questions? You need to ask the historical questions. So he's up in Damascus, but he knows that his identity is in contradistinction, is in opposition to the Judeo-Christian identity. His problem are, is the Byzantine Empire. So what does he do? He goes to Jerusalem, which is the seat of Christianity, the seat of the Byzantine Empire, where they have their holiest building, which is the Holy Sepulcher right there. And he builds his building across the valley and higher up. He puts it higher than the Holy Sepulchre, across the valley, and he has it pointing towards Petra. As if to say, we are now the new empire. We now have our new prophetic line. Because what does he do inside the Dome of the Rock? Well, if you look at the Dome of the Rock today, that's not the Dome of the Rock that was originally built. That has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. What you're looking at is the facade from 1876 little over 100 years old. It's a very new facade. To know what's in the Dome of the Rock, you need to look and you need to go into what they call the inner ambulatories. These two circular, that's the only original part of the Dome of the Rock that still exists today. And when you look at those inner ambulatories, you need to look at the Arab inscriptions that are up there. Because that's the Arab inscription that, that 
ex expose everything. Now, if you were to go to any Muslim and ask him why the Dome of the Rock is important, they'll say it's the third most holy shrine because this is where Muhammad was flown to on the back of the winged horse from um, uh, Medina up to, I'm sorry, from Mecca up to Jerusalem. And then he went up to the seven heavens there, uh, the, uh, the rock. Uh, the rock, he went up to the seven heavens, met Allah, was told to pray 50 times a day, came down to the fifth heaven, met Moses, and he bounced back and forth between Allah and Moses and got the prayers down from 45 to 35 to 15 to 10 down to five prayers. Once he got five prayers, Moses, that's enough. So he heads on back down to this place and then he flies on back to um, Medina, sorry, Mecca. So that's known as the Mirage. That's the story, the Mirage. Which means if this building was built to commemorate that event, it should have reference to it, right? Look at all those inscriptions. There's no reference anywhere to any place or any event called the Mirage. There's no reference to Muhammad going up to any heavens or meeting Moses or going on the back of the winged horse, the Burak. None of that is referred to. So what's on those inscriptions? Surah 4, Ayah 171. O people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion. Jesus, the son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah. Say not three that he should have a son, for God does not have a son. Who is that attacking? Jesus and his divinity and his sonship. Surah 17, Ayah 111. Who hath not taken unto himself a son, and who hath no partner, nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. Who is that against? Jesus again. The inscriptions are all against Jesus Christ. And it's on those inscriptions where you first, the first reference to Muhammad is the messenger of God. Attacking Jesus, he's, he begetteth not, nor was begotten, none comparable unto him, Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is where Muhammad is now introduced. Even before the coins are coined. This is a year before the coins are coined. He is introduced in the Dome of the Rock. You take the biggest structure in the history of that, of that time, the biggest structure that was ever built, you make it bigger than what the Christians have, you put it higher up, and then you introduce your prophet. This is the first time we see Muhammad's name. Isn't that interesting? 60 years after he died, no reference to his name from any Arab sources until the Dome of the Rock. Now, once you have done that, you now pretty much say, this is the new prophet. This is the prophet who does not, he is not the son of God, and he is not the partner of God. Now can you understand why Muslims, the first question they ask us in almost every conversation is God does not have a son, and how can Jesus be God? Listen, they've been doing that from the very beginning. If this is correct, and if we're correct on this, it looks like the earliest inscriptions, how Islam began, was an attack against our Lord and his divinity, against the Byzantine Empire, and against the sonship of Jesus. So now he, is, he builds a larger sanctuary than the Arab, with the Arab structure. He incorporates inscriptions. He introduces his faith, Islam. That's the first time we see the word Islam introduced. He introduces his people, the Muslims. He introduces his prophet, Muhammad. The caliphal protocols, and this is where Yehuda Nebo has really done a great job. He's looked at all the caliphal protocols from the Sufiani period of the Umayyad caliph, up from 661 up until 685, when the, 680, when the Marwanids come to power. These are the official documents of the caliphs. And there's no reference on any of these documents about a man named Muhammad. There's no reference on any of these documents of people called Muslims, or a religion called Islam, or a book called the Quran. Yet these are supposedly the first Muslim documents. Why? Because they weren't Muslims. This was not Islam. The Bismillah is not even the Bismillah we have today. And then in 691, when Abd al Malik's in power, almost overnight, suddenly, Muhammad is introduced as the prophet of God. Now come the name Islam and the name Muslim are introduced, and it happens overnight. And from that on, from 691, every caliphal protocol starts with the Bismillah. But it all begins with Abd al Malik. Say again? Have anybody changed the caliphal protocols? We have them. We can look at them. You can see they have not been changed. And the fact is, why is it Muslims have never look, investigated this themselves? Why aren't Muslims, since they own the protocols, why do Yehuda Neville from Jerusalem University have to go and even find this out? Fascinating. But can you see, it all fits with the architectural. It all fits with the coins. It all fits with the documentary evidence. All the evidence is pointing to Abdul Malik, who introduces... So he introduces Muhammad. Of course, if you're going to introduce a man, you need to have a revelation. Every prophet needs a revelation. That's what's missing. You also have him pointing towards the wrong place, Petra. But then in 713, Petra is destroyed by an earthquake. Once 
Petra is destroyed, no longer is God there. God no longer, that's a sign that God has now left Petra. So you've got to choose a new place. And that's why Mecca was then chosen. Why Mecca? Because that's where Abdul Malik comes from. That's where his family comes from. They come from the Hejaz. Looks like Mecca could have been a previous pagan, a pagan sanctuary. And that's why when you take a look at Mecca today, it makes no sense whatsoever what they do there. Why are they one running back and forth between Saf and Marwan? Why are these two hills that they run back and forth seven times? It makes no sense. Why are they throwing stones at three Jamarats? Why three? When you ask a Muslim, that's a, they would say it's three devils. I don't remember being, having three devils in the Quran. There's only one devil. Suggesting that these pre, probably are pagan rituals, pre-Islamic pagan rituals. That's why more needs to be studied on Mecca. So you now have a prophet. You need a revelation. You now have a sanctuary. And now they need a history. And that's why can you now understand why the history is not introduced until 833. The sayings are not introduced until 870. Of the um, uh, um, Sahih Bukhari is given 600,000 of these sayings. And he's to look at them and to throw out all the ones that are considered to be fraudulent. He does this between 850 and 870. Remember, Muhammad died in 632. So for 20 years, he whittles away, whittles away, whittles away, and he throws out 98% of it and only retains 2%. He only retains 7,397. From 600,000, he whittles it down to 7,397. What was his criteria for throwing out 98%? And what did he do with that 98%? Wouldn't you like to read it? I would like to see what they've thrown away. But we're not going to see it. They were all destroyed. So all we have is Al-Buhari. He's the first one then to tell us how the Quran was put together. But he's talking about, he's telling us a good 200 years later. Ninth century is finally when we finally get the book, the man, the place, and the story. And then a new religion is formed and growing. Not between the 222 years, like Muslims like to tell us, but looks like two to 300 years. What about the Quran? Here, here, now here we get into the really gritty stuff, because now we get to the Quran. What are we going to do with this Quran? We've got the man, we've got the place, yet every prophet has a revelation. Where was Muhammad's revelation? If he is chosen of the prophet, he's got to have a revelation. But he's been dead for 60 years. So you've got a problem here. So what do you do? Well... What do the Islamic traditions tell us? They say it's, this is, the, this is the, superior to all of the revelations. And I always ask the Muslims four questions whenever I talk about the revelation. You can ask the same four questions. Is this Quran eternal? Every Muslim will have to say yes. Am I correct on that? Is this Quran sent down? Was it sent down to a man named Muhammad between 610 and 632, that 22-year period? They all have to say yes. I don't know of any Muslim, whether they radical, nominal, or liberal, possibly not the liberals, that would not say yes to that. Was it complete at the time of Uthman, 20 years after Muhammad's death? He's the one that actually compiled it in its final form, the one that we use today. They have to say yes. And is it unchanged? In other words, the Quran we have in our hand today, is it the same Quran that was revealed to Muhammad, that was codified at the time of Uthman, that exists in that eternal tablet in heaven? Every Muslim will say yes to those four. Can you remember those four words? Eternal, sent down, complete, unchanged. That's all you have to remember. I did this in a debate with Dr. Shabir Ali back in, 19, in 2014, uh, where we asked this very question. They're in Toronto, and I just asked those four simple questions. And he said, yes, 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 to all of them. So all I needed to ask was a fifth question. Prove it. <laughs> prove it. Now, you can't prove eternality. I don't expect him to prove that. You can't prove down whether it was sent to Muhammad, because we don't know anything about Muhammad or anything came from that time. I'm just asking him to prove the last two, number three and four. I want you to show me one manuscript... One manuscript of the Quran from the time of Uthman that is complete and unchanged. That's all we're asking. That's pretty simple enough, isn't it? Since they are the ones that claim it, we don't claim it. We would never claim that about our Bible. Well, our Bible is not eternal. Please don't say that. Sent down? No, it was not sent down. Inspired? Yes, but not sent down. Complete? Yes, we would agree with that. When in its original form it was complete. Unchanged? No, it has been changed. We know where the changes are. We even warn the readers where the changes are. So we would never make those four claims. We would only make one of them, okay? So this is not our problem. This is their problem. See how easy it makes? I'm making it. You ask them these questions. Put them on the hot seat and ask them to show you one manuscript that is complete and unchanged from the mid-7th century, 652. Prove it. Now, they do believe that six manuscripts do exist today. They would say, the six major ones, and this is Al-Buhari. This is where it goes into that whole reference about how it was put together. It's in volume six, 
Hadith number 509 and Hadith number 510. And it says very clearly that Uthman gave Zaid ibn Thabit along with Zab, Zab, uh, Allah Subed and Hal Al Hadith, the four of them, were to rewrite the Quran and in 650 at the time of Uthman. And then once they had rewritten the Quran, they were to send it out to every province. Now, how many provinces were there at that time? There were nine provinces. Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Nishapur, and Herat. Those are the nine provinces that existed at the time of, of the, uh, the time of Uthman. So they sent nine copies to nine cities in the mid-7th century. And then what does it say? And all the other fragmentary copies, they were burnt. They burnt everything else. Why do you burn manuscripts? Because they disagreed. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. That's hard enough anyways. But nonetheless, we're not going to stick with that. Let's continue and let's ask about these nine copies. The ones that sent to Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, Cairo, Alexandria, Aden, Herat, and Nishapur. We're talking only about 1,400 years ago. Listen, if you want to see how much we have for our New Testament account, just come down to the British Library and I'll show you the entire 27 books of the New Testament called the uh, Sinaiticus that has been around since the 4th century. That's 300 years before what we're talking now. Right next to it is the Alexandrinus. That's from the 5th century. That's 200 years from what we're talking about talking now. If we could come up with 265 either partial or complete manuscripts of our New Testament but before the 6th century, certainly the Muslims can come up with one. One. That's all we're asking. We just want one of the nine. And see, they claim that they do exist. The nine that they claim exist are these ones here. The Topkapi, which is in the Topkapi Museum there in Istanbul in Turkey, the Samarkan, which is in Tashkent in Uzbekistan, the Ma'il, which is in the British Library there in London, so we know that one quite well, the Hosseini Manuscript, which is in Cairo there in Egypt, the Petropolis, which is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris there in France, and then the most exciting, the Sana Manuscript, which is just discovered in 1975 in Sana there in Yemen. Those are the six major manuscripts. The problem is, except for the Petropolis and the Ma'il Manuscript, we have not had access to any of these manuscripts. We can't. We can't touch them. We can't do any forensic testing on them. We would love to have done so. For 30 years, I've been, we've been asking to try to get close to these manuscripts, and we could not. But that changed in 2002. Two Turkish scholars, Dr. Ekmelin Isaladu and Dr. Tahir Atakulic, finally were given access for five years. And from 2002 to 2007, they were able to look at these six manuscripts and come up to their conclusions. Now, their conclusions are written right here. We have the entire, their entire book. It's 1,000 pages long. This is just the introduction. It's all in English, so you can all read it. All you need to do is read this 83 pages and weep. Because this destroys everything we have heard about the Quran. Now remember, these are the two leading authorities in the Muslim world on the Islamic Quranic manuscript. They own the top copy. They are the ones that have the best work. They are the only ones that have had access to all six manuscripts for five years. And this is their conclusion. Let's go through what they're saying. And they're, Muslims. they're Muslims themselves. They're from Turkey. What kind of Muslims? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not going to say they're radical or nominal or liberal, but they are scholars of the first degree. And that's why, we have, and that's why Muslims have to take them seriously, because they're their own kind. Now, Dr. Ikhmel al says, we have no Uthmanic Musaf. There is no Musaf. Musaf means manuscript. There is no codex from the time of Uthman. Not at all. Nor do we have any copies of these Musafs. These Musafs date from a later Umayyad period. The Umayyad period goes from 661 up until 749. The later Umayyad period means they're all 8th century manuscripts. Every one of them, except for one. Dr. Tayyar Atakulic is, much, is the greater scholar of the two. He says there have been no seriously scholarly work has been done on them until they did their work. These Musafs date from the early to mid 8th century. They are not Uthmanic, nor are they copies sent by them. He looked at the top copy, and he dated the top copy, which is the best, the most complete of all the manuscripts that, that exist today. He dated it to the mid 8th century. That's 100 years after Uthman. That it only contains, though it includes 99% of the Quran, so much of it is damaged, only 78% of it can be read. And of the 78% that can be read, there are 2,270 manuscript variants. Ooh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Manuscript variants. That means words or phrases that are different in that manuscript than the Quran we have today. Now, why haven't we been told this? Why has it taken 1,400 years for them to tell us this? The Samarkan manuscript is, is from the early 8th century. It's earlier than the top copy, they say, but it only goes up to Surah 43. There's 114 surahs. More than that, they said it is full of grammatical errors. It has scribal copious errors. It uses poor Arabic. In fact, they said it's an embarrassment because it's such a hopeless text. 
Obviously, whoever wrote it did not know Arabic very well. The Ma'il, which is in the British Library, we've already known about it. It only goes up to Surah 43. It is from the early 8th century, and it has many variants. We've always known this about that, and that's why we knew what they were going to find. The Husseini manuscript is much, much too late. It's what they call a monumental text. It is dated by Tahir Kotikalich to the mid-8th century. Dr. Franco Doroj dates it to the 9th century because of the size of the text. It has variants. The Petropolis manuscript, which Dr. Franco Doroj owns and controls there at the Par uh, in Paris, it is an early 8th century manuscript, but it is only 26% of the Quran. It is not complete. And in, in that 26%, it has 93 variants from the Quran that we have today. The Sada manuscript is the most exciting. This was discovered in 1975. In 1981, three German scholars, Gerd Prynne, von Bothmer, and Oleg, were flown down to then look at it because they were the only ones that could read it because it has no diacritical marks and has no vowelizations, no dots above and below the line. And as they then uh, took pictures of it, they realized that they were reading, they're holding a very archaic text uh, because they noticed that it, on this side, on this side over here, they had a script that dated to 705. There's Surah 19, and that yellow mark, it jumps to Surah 22. What happened to Surah 20 and 21? Well, Surah 20 begins over on this side of the page in a completely different script. There's about 60 to 70 years between these two pages. Ooh, two, 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 two. Which means you see an evolution in the manuscript, this manuscript right here. Now, I went to see them. I went to see Gerd Prynne in Germany in 1999, and I took a picture of a facsimile. This is not the manuscript itself. This is just a photo of it. And he showed me all these orange marks. Every time you see an orange mark, that is a manuscript variant. That means a word that is different in that text from the Quran we have today. There's over a thousand of these manuscript variants in just this text. When they looked uh, at under ultraviolet light, they noticed that there's a script underneath. Do you see the script there, very faint? These are all written on parchment, on vellum. This means animal skin, which you can wash off and rewrite over top, and wash off and rewrite over top. As they looked at it, they wanted to separate the two texts, and guess what they found? The lower text is seventh century, probably the last two decades of the seventh century. The upper text and the lower text don't agree. Ooh, I love that which means between the end of the 7th century and the early 8th century, the Quran was already changing. Now, Dr. Gerprin's wife, Elizabeth Prynne, has just now come out of a book. She is now looking at all the differences. We're waiting for it to be published in English. It's already published in German. You can read it and tell us what she says. Because she is now exposing this palimpsest and showing that we have a completely different Quran underneath from what we have on top. Now, Let's get to the corrections, and here's where it really gets juicy. This is what I introduced back in 2014 to Dr. Shabir Ali. I said, Shabir Ali, have you looked and seen the corrections? He said, there are no corrections. I said, yes, there are. Dr. Dan Brubaker did his doctoral thesis looking at corrections. That's all he wanted to look at was to see if there are any manuscript variants, just one or two, possibly 15 was what he was hoping to find. He looked at six of these, six manuscripts that we've looked at, plus four others that come later. So he looked at 10 manuscripts just to look for corrections. Guess what he found? Hundreds upon hundreds of insertions. Words that are put above the line. Above the line. See these words that are added at a later date. He found hundreds of erasers where they just erase words. Why would they erase them? Of course, because they're changing the text. He found these erasers that were all written. There they erased an entire line, and then they wrote, in fact, two lines, and they wrote over top of it. Here you can see a word that has now been written over top of a completely different word. Sometimes it's written within a completely different color. Then he found these overwritings without erasers. They didn't even bother to erase it. They just wrote over top so we can read both the lower and the upper text. He found tapings, which he thought were because of damage, but when he looked on the backside, there was no damage, so obviously they're trying to hide something there. Look at the tapings. There's a taping. There's a taping. There's a taping. There's a taping. Look at all these tapings. Wouldn't you love to know what's underneath that tape to see what they're trying to hide? And then he found these coverings. These selective coverings, there's a covering, there's a covering, there's a covering, there's a covering. Look at that, it's so, so many coverings, you can't, you can't even understand what's being said. Obviously, they're trying to change the text. Sometimes they had coverings with just one or two letters written over top, like the cuff here. Here's a covering with another word that's written over top. There's a covering, there's a covering, with new words written over top. They, he found, by the time he did his finish his doctorate in 2014, 800 of these corrections. Not just 15, 800. And in every case, every one of the corrections was consonantal, which means it changes the whole meaning of the word. 
These were not vowelizations. These were not Dagger Alephs, like Muslims try to say today. He purposely did not include any Dagger Alephs in them. These had nothing to do with vowelization because there were no vowels there. This vowelization was only introduced in the 9th century and the 10th century, which means that in every case they were changing the meaning of the text. And what was most disturbing was that these corrections continued up until the 9th century. For 200 years they were correcting it. 200 years after Uthman, standardizing the text. Western scholars now are concluding that the earliest Muslims begin to appear in the 8th century. Muslim scholars like Ekmeladin and al Takulic now conclude that the earliest Muslims begin to appear in the 8th century. Even Islamic Awareness, the most prodigious, the largest website on manuscript, Islamic Quranic manuscript, has now finally admitted, because of the work of these two um, Muslim scholars, that the earliest manuscripts do not appear until the late 7th and early 8th century. The latest research shows that even these Muslims have seven forms of correction dating up until the 9th century. Therefore, since the Muslims cannot prove that there are any complete manuscripts from the time of Uthman, I would suggest that the Quran is not eternal. I would suggest that it was not sent down. It was not complete in 650. It was not the same. It has been changed. Therefore, who is Muhammad and what was his purpose? I said this in the debate with Dr. Shabir Ali, and he was upset when I said that. He said, I hope you're saying that tongue-in-cheek. I said, no, we're not. 2014, we laid down the gauntlet. If you cannot find one manuscript from the same century as Muhammad, and if the only manuscripts you can find, the six that you do have, only begin to appear in the 8th century, 60 to 100 years later, if not one of them agrees with each other, if not one of them is complete, and not one of them agrees with the Quran you have today, then where and when did you get your Quran? Now, he had 35 minutes to rebut me. He spent 19 minutes, I kid you not, 19 minutes talking about the miracle of the number 19. If you look at these set of verses, you look at these set of verses, you get 19. With these set of letters, with these set of letters, you get 19. With these verses and these verses, 19, 19, 19, 19 minutes wasting our time. <laughs> I finally got up and I said, what verses are you talking about? Every one of these manuscripts that I showed him, not one of them had verses in them. Verses were not created until the 9th and 10th century. So what verses are you referring to? And what manuscript are you referring to? He finally had to admit which manuscript he was talking about. Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? When was the Quran finally canonized? 1924. At Al-Azhar University, less than 100 years ago in Cairo. The text they're using today only comes from 1924. I turned to Shabir Ali and I said, you know, Prince Philip is older than your Quran. <laughs> And it's exactly what the truth. The Quran they're used to today is less than 100 years old, which means who is Muhammad and what is his purpose? We could have seen that we don't even have any reference to Muhammad until 691. We have no biography for him until 833. We have no sayings of his until 870. We don't even know where his city is until 741. With all this coming together, can you understand now why we're asking these questions and why no Muslim will debate me on this anymore? They refuse to debate me. I lie. Next month I'll be debating in Grand Rapids with a Turkish. I don't think he knows. He's, he's not seen my, uh, the video of what happened there in Toronto. But we'll be debating this next month there in Grand Rapids. Now, let's go to the Quranic folios. This just came out in July of last year. They found two fragments, two pages of a Quran that were found in the Birmingham Library in a folio, a manuscript there that didn't belong. Um, Dr. Uh, Abdel Fadeli noticed it, and so she took it down to Oxford University Labs to be tested with using um, carbon dating 14. And they looked at the dates, and they found that the dates were 568 to 645. Now, that went all over the world. BBC put it front headline news. It was there. Uh, uh, July 22nd and July 23rd, the top of the news on their website, also on their newspapers, not, I mean, sorry, in their television. And Dr. David Thomas was brought out. He was, he's from Birmingham, and he said, the writer of this manuscript could well have known the prophet Muhammad. He would have seen him probably. He would maybe have heard him preach. He may have known him personally, and that really is quite a thought to conjure up. Any problem with this? Six, uh, 568, Muhammad was by, born in 570, to 645, Muhammad died in 632. Any of you see a problem with those dates? Now, why do you say, is it such a huge stretch? Well, that's because carbon dating is very inexact. So it's a 77-year stretch of probability of 95% probability. It could be 568, it could be 645. But from what I've said tonight, 
or this afternoon. Can you see a problem with that lady's date? When was the Quran written down? 652, right? Under Uthman. So how can you have a Quran that predates Uthman? To say nothing of the fact that if it's 568, it predates Muhammad as well. They hadn't bothered to look at the dates carefully enough. But it didn't stop there. See, that's not the only manuscript we have. When you look at carbon dating, it tells you the time that the animal was slaughtered and that the carbon-14 decay of nitrogen-14 begins to form. That's all you do. You'll be able, you're able to look at it. But the Birmingham folios, when you look at it, you will notice that it includes Surah 18, Surah 19, and Surah 20, the two folios that we're, excuse me, that we're looking at that are dated then. When you look at those references, you will see that Surah 18 is about the seven sleepers of Ephesus. This is not Quranic. This is actually borrowed from other material. That comes from the uh, Gregory of Tours, and there's a Syriac version of it by, King J uh, by James of Sarug in 521. So this was around from the 6th century. Uh, Surah 19 uh, comes a Syriac work from the Proto-Evangelium of James and Gospel of Pseudo-Matthew from the 3rd century. And of course, the story of Moses, Surah 20, is exactly straight out of our Bible. So all of these predate the Quran, do they not? These are nothing more than borrowed stories. Are you starting to see where we're going with this? What was interesting is they then started looking at manuscripts from Sana. They wanted to look at some of the dates on them. Take a look at all the multiplicity of dates. But what was most damaging is when they started using it in other labs. They went to Leon lab. They went to Kiel lab. They went to the Arizona lab. The Arizona lab and the, and the Oxford lab are considered to be the best in the world. And look at the dates they found on those manuscripts. 388 to 535. That's even before Muhammad was born. 443 to 599. Muhammad was, was less than 20 years old. When that has the latest date. 430 to 611, 443 to 599. These are way before Muhammad. These are way before the Quran. Because the Quran was only introduced in 610, according to the Islamic traditions. Finalized in 652, or 632, excuse me. See, these go back to the 5th century. These have yet to be published, by the way. Muslims do not know about this. You're getting to learn something before the Muslims know because they're being very careful about publishing this because this is going to cause huge anger across the Muslim world. What does that suggest and what are these documents? I would suggest that these are the very documents the Quran borrowed from. When you look at the Quran, a good 70% of the Quran is borrowed from other sources, mainly Jewish apocryphal writings and Christian Syriac sectarian writings. Um, Dr. G uh, um, Dr. von Bolfen, sorry, Dr. Luling, out of Germany, noticed that much of the poetry in the Quran, the beautiful poetry that's in the Quran, he was able to trace every one of those poetries, strophe by strophe, to pre-Islamic Christian hymns written in the fifth and sixth century, interposed that into Arabic, almost exactly line for line the same. Muslims claim that this is the miracle of the Quran because how could a man who could not read or write write such beautiful poetry? I would suggest that they should give credit to the Christians that wrote it and have nothing to do with Muhammad. <laughs> so you can see what we're coming across. Abraham in Mecca, Surah 21, that comes from the mission of Rabbah. Cain and Abel in Surah 5, that comes from the Targum of John ben Isaiah. These are second century apocryphal accounts. The story of Queen of Sheba in Surah 21 comes from the second Targum of Esther. That is again a second century. These are all long before. Take a look at all these stories in the Quran. Every one of these we can uh, 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 find antecedents for using source criticism. Conclusion, it looks like these are pre-Islamic, pre-Muhammad, and pre-Quranic. Be careful, Muslims, don't ballyhoo about that because we're not going to show you exactly where the Quran comes from. It's nothing more than borrowed material. So, let's conclude. Why are there no Muslim sources for 200 years? Why do the claims they make not fit the historical record? Why are the geographical references so few and confusing? Why do they all seem to be much further north? Why are there so many references to vegetation which wouldn't exist in Mecca? Why is Mecca not mentioned until 741? Why is it not on the trade route? Why are all the Kibbas facing Petra for the first 100 years, and then confused for the next 100, and don't even get canonized until 822, 200 years too late? What is Abdul Malik's role in all of this, and does a nascent Islam really begin with him? About Muhammad, you can read that conclusion like it looks like we've got the wrong man in the wrong place doing the wrong thing in the wrong time. <laughs> Yet when we get to Jesus, we know where he was born, we know where he grew up, we know where he died, we know what he did, we know from eyewitness accounts, we know from hostile accounts, we know that, how, when they were written, which means we have the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> can you see how easy this is in a public context? Now can you see why Muslims will not debate us on this? 
because we can have them coming and going. Using the same criteria that we're asking of the Quran, we ask of the Bible. The same criteria we ask of Jesus Christ, we ask of Muhammad. And in every case, Jesus comes out on top. Now, we're not surprised by that. In every case, the Bible proves to be correct. We're not surprised by that. What we have not done is to apply the same text, the same criteria, the same criticism against the Quran of Muhammad. Now, look what we're finding. And this has all been around for only two years. I've been working with Islam for 33 years. I've never had it this easy. And yet, notice everything, except what I've said about Jesus Christ today. Notice that everything I have introduced today is from a neutral perspective. Anybody can say what I've just said. This is not a Christian polemic. This is a historical polemic, which is as neutral as you can get. When I introduce this in London, the people that come and shake my hand usually are atheists and humanists. And you know what they say? Finally, we found a Christian that doesn't want to tell us his testimony. <laughs> You're finally speaking our language. We don't care dilly swat about what God has done for you. We are asking a much more simple question. Is it true? Is the man you're talking about living in the right place at the right time doing the right thing? That's all we're asking. These are historical questions, and we've never bothered to answer these questions. And we're not only answering these questions, we're asking the very same thing of the Muslims. We could do that with the Baha'u'llah Dida, we could do that with the Upanishad, we could do it with any religious piece of book, including the Book of Mormon, and yes, the Granth Sahib. We have to do it with every religious book. The Bible is the only one that has passed every test. That's why I love it what I'm doing. It makes my job so much easier. But I hope this encourages you. I'm not asking you to do this, all right? This is not for you to do. This is for those of us who are debating it, who are the polemicists. Now, remember I said we don't believe that our Bible is eternal. We would not make the same claims about the Bible that they do about the Quran. But see, the Bible is not the only word of God that we have, is it? John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was ho theos, logos. And he took on flesh. So he is the word of God, is he not? Is Jesus eternal? Yes, he is. Was Jesus sent down? Yes, he was. Is he complete? Yes, he is. Has he changed? No, he hasn't. So the very four things the Muslims have to say yes to about their word of God, we can say about our word of God. We can bring them home, folks. Everything they want, we've already got. Let's bring them home. Because we can say yes to everyone. We have what they're looking for, and his name is Jesus. Oh, I love this. That's why it makes it so much easier, because we can then introduce the gospel even in the same critique.